Anyways, our next presentation is uh, uh, 2021 Field Peak Challenges and Tips for 2022. Uh, we have Anastasia Kubinek, who is the agronomist for Roquette Canada. And uh, Anastasia has been an agronomist in Manitoba for over 20 years in both private industry and government. And in all her roles, she's traveled Manitoba extensively looking for wild and wonderful things in the field and then communicating those findings and potential wins uh, through extension. Since the fall of 2020, uh, her focus has been on field peas for Roquette Canada Limited uh, to supply their pea processing plant in Port Prairie and for the, for, plant protein in, uh, for the plant protein ingredient market. So Anastasia, um, un un unmute yourself and away we go. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, virtual is not my best performance. I prefer to be live, but as the way things are, again, I really appreciate you inviting me here. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is the field pea challenges that we saw in 2021 and then some tips for 2022. So as lots of you know, um, the pea fields have really increased when we start looking at the landscape in Manitoba. Just a few little stats. So back in 2017, when I think Terry Buss was talking about why not 300,000 field peas in Manitoba and is it possible? We were sitting at about uh, 65,000 acres. So for 2021, we're actually at about 212,000 acres. So it is dramatically increased. And with that, um, you know, we see a lot more peas everywhere in Manitoba. We've seen a lot of unusual things, especially last or this year with the dry weather. And there's a few things to look forward to in the future to make sure that if you are planning on growing peas or your clients are, you can set them up for success. So first of all, no surprise to anybody, peas actually need some rain to get yield. So our average yields in Manitoba from 2015 to 2020, based on crop insurance, are about 47. Um, my best guess, and I will see if Yield Manitoba tells me uh, whether or not I was correct, is probably about 36 bushels an acre this year. And that's going from the fields that really had no yield to some of the fields in our northwest region that actually had really great yields. But unfortunately, lots of the areas of the province does not get the rain at the right time, and it did not contribute to the yield that we wanted. And really, the worst affected areas corresponded to the areas with the least amount of rain. That was pretty common for any crop, whether it be canola, wheat, peas. We just needed that rain to get those yields going, coming. So pea yields, where does it come from? Well, no surprise. You need plants, you need pods, you need seeds, and that gives you the yield. So this is just a really rough estimate of kind of what we're looking at when it comes to plant stands, pods, seeds, and what that could contribute to yield. And where I'm leading with this is I'm really going to talk about plant stands because that was something that I saw as a huge indicator in May of what we would be expecting for yields when it came to August. So the lower your plant stand count, so we have here four up to seven, and I know our expected range is we'd really like that seven to nine plants per square foot. Um, it increases dramatically when you go up for those plant counts. So plant counts are really important. And that is really something that if we can start off right and make sure we're really targeting those live plants coming out of the ground, we're really going to set ourselves up for success, honestly, regardless of the weather that we're going to get later on in the season. So poor live plant stands, that was the biggest issue that I saw this year. I saw lots of guys that if all of their seeds came out of the ground and everything was fantastic, they would have been getting nine plants per square foot. That's what they targeted. Our more common plant stand was probably five. And there was a lot of things that went to do or contributed to that. So here I have here just a really quick indicator when your producers or you yourself are planning on peas this year, some big things to ask for, your thousand kernel weight. Pea seed this year is a bit smaller. So take that into consideration when you're figuring out how many seeds you need or how many bushels an acre you're gonna to plant to get your desired plant stands. So I just made a really small chart here. I just have our desired population of seven or eight, or here's your plants per acre. And then coming back here, this is kind of the seed size that I would expect you're gonna find anywhere from 220 to probably 240. Uh, and then ask for your germination. You need to take that in consideration because if you have seeds that you're planting that aren't gonna germ, they're not coming out of the ground, um, take into consideration a little bit of survival. And we're going to talk about what contributes to survival in a couple minutes. But figure that out and then base that um, seeded bushels per acre on that, not just your standard three. 
So if we're getting a little bit larger seed, you might have to plant a little bit more. Smaller seed, you might need to plant a little bit less. So here we have here my lovely models um, doing some measurements to figure out kind of what uh, the targeted range was when they're calibrating their seeder. Also, when putting your seed into the drill, I really would recommend gentle handling. The seed that you're getting out of the seed grower or out of your bin um, and that germination that you have there, you want to maintain that going into your seeder. So using a conveyor, great idea. If you don't have a conveyor and you have an auger, low or make sure it's full, make sure it's low, low speed. And then that will hopefully reduce some of the, the cracking and damage. So those two things will really help your germination going into the field. So another thing I saw was staggered emergence and poor nodulation. So managing your seed depth. This was probably one of the biggest contributors that I saw to whether or not plants came out of the ground. I know most farmers probably were targeting that inch and a half, two inches, maybe two and a half inches, chasing a little bit of moisture. But I did see a lot of seeds that were sitting at an inch, half an inch, maybe on the ground. And those seeds really were stranded by the dry soil. So that huge variability in seeding depth, unfortunately this year, that seeding thin really showed up in the field. We saw those seeds then germinating in August when the rain came, but that did not contribute to yield. It was those ones that really were tucked into that nice moist layer. Those were the ones that were germinating and those were the ones that were coming out of the ground and contributing to yield. So something to consider going into the field, just you know, making sure wings, however your drill is set up, everything's kind of even stopping, make sure your seeding depth is fairly even, and that will really help with your emergence and your plant stand coming out of the ground. Inoculant. So one thing we did notice uh, last year as well, and something we're thinking about this year, is with this huge increase of pea acres, we have a lot of pea growers that are not pea growers. They are guys that see the market potential, they see that fertilizer prices are high, peas don't need nitrogen, they see that maybe there's some good pricing out there. And this maybe is the first year that they have grown peas ever, or the first year that they have probably grown peas in maybe 20 years. So these folks, we really need to be concerned about their inoculant. We need to make sure that the inoculant is there, that it's going to trigger nodulation in that pea plant, and that pea plant is going to start to produce nitrogen if it needs it. So what we're really recommending uh, for ourselves as Roquette, as well as talking to Dennis and some of the pulse grower agronomists, granular is really better. It is more consistent. Whether your soils are wet, your soils are dry, that granular just seems to be more resilient for longer and it infects those roots a lot better and we are getting that nodulation. This year, it was very disheartening when I would go to fields. Um, first time pea grower, maybe they um, did not put inoculant down with the field or with their peas or potentially they just used a liquid and it was very dry conditions and the liquid did not infect those roots and they had really poor nodulation. So uh, we don't wanna see that again. Um, really, if you are a first time pea grower or you have farmers that are first time pea growers, double inoculation is probably a really good opportunity to try and make sure that nodulation gets off to the best start. So it could be liquid on seed, um, granular in row, it could be uh, double granular. It could be a whole bunch of different combinations. So making sure that those nodules are there is going to get you off to a great start. So going into some of the 2022 things. So I talked about what I saw that really didn't work and was issues for 2021. 2022, we have a few issues remaining. So our first one is nitrogen. And this was talked about yesterday um, when they were talking about some of the situations that we had with crops not using all the nitrogen or all the fertilizer that was put down in them, excess nitrogen remaining in the soil, and what to do with that. So uh, we put together a bit of a chart here. Uh, this was based on some of the research that I believe John Hurd was showing and Den talking about Dennis and lentils. So we're saying if your soils are sitting at that below 50 pounds per acre nitrogen, we are at normal situations. That's the zero to six and the zero to 24. We uh, kind of broke them up. Nodulation will occur as normal. The crop will fix nitrogen for what the crop needs. Inoculate your peas with liquid or granular as normal, and that will assist with your nodulation. Where things get a little bit more interesting is in these second and third scenarios here. So the second one is your zero to six may be under 50, but your six to 24 is 50 to 100. So what we're saying in this situation, peas is probably still an okay option. That zero to six 
inch range is where our normal nodulation is gonna happen in those peas. So whatever we can do to make sure that nodulation is maximized for the potential is what we need to do here. Peas, um, they use a bit of their energy and uh, it's a bit of a cost to a pea plant to actually produce those nodules. So if there is nitrogen in the soil, it is totally gonna use it. But unfortunately with peas, um, even though we don't have to add nitrogen, they are still using about three pounds per bushel to produce that crop of nitrogen. So if you have a pea that's wanting, you know, potential 50 bushels an acre, which would be awesome next year, that's 150 pounds of nitrogen. If you're sitting at 80 pounds in the soil, eventually that pea is going to run out. So you better hope that you have nodules that can pull from the air, create nitrogen for that pea and support it all the way through flowering, through pod set, through seed set. And that's where we really need that nitrogen. So we really need to make sure in these situations, if you're still growing peas, you are inoculating properly. Again, um, using that granular inoculant, being a little bit more uh, tolerant of whatever extremes we get in the soils would be great. A liquid and a granular, wonderful as well. Just whatever we can do to try and induce some of those nodules. At that situation, you know, maybe the peas aren't using the nodules at the start, but they're definitely gonna be using them when it gets to crunch time and they are trying to produce yield. So that's where we need them. When we get into the situations in the bottom here, where our zero to six is over 100 or a six to 24 is over 100, you know what? Another crop is maybe your best option here. You've got lots of nitrogen there. Nodulation, nodulation on the peas will be affected. It is probably gonna be reduced. And we may start running into issues where you have this amazing looking crop going into flowering, beautiful lush green, but if no nodules are there, it could run out of nitrogen and you may get really limited yields just because it did not have enough nitrogen to actually support the pod set and the seed fill. So just something to consider going into 2022. Another thing going into 2022, checking my time, um, is some of the things that were brought up this morning by Sarah Lancaster. We have the potential for herbicide carryover. We saw it in 2021. So we're really recommending that if the following products are applied in 2021, do not plant peas in 2022. So the big ones that you're looking for is the clopyrrolid products. I have a list there. These restrictions are due to reduced rainfall. Glucarbazone, so that's our Everest and Sierra and these other products here. These restrictions are due to rainfall plus high pH and low organic matter. We saw a lot of these issues on eroded knolls, on sandy patches and fields. So we are really cautioning folks that in 2022, if you've applied that product in 2021 on your wheat, don't plant peas there. Another one that we're looking at is pyrosulfatol. So this is anything that has infinity in it. So whether it's infinity, velocity, tundra, this is due to the high pH and lower organic matters. And again, in 2021, we saw this issue. Again, on eroded knolls, sandy patches, Areas where we typically know that we do have higher pHs and low organic matters. It was very, very obvious in the field. And we even went as far in some fields where we had the issues looking at satellite imagery and you could pick it up very clearly. So what the issues are with this in the field is you're gonna have um, reduced plant growth. You're gonna have reduced plant development. Those plants may recover, but they are not producing yield and they are gonna be grass green when the rest of your field is ready to harvest. So definitely issues you want to avoid if you can. Recrop for two years for a cert muster command and option. This is all years, not just 21 going into 2022. Just don't plant peas there. So if you're looking at the situation here and saying, oh, geez, you know, my grower had wheat last year. We use these products. Canola is a great option to plant your peas on. So here's an example from MASC. This is their new update for their 2011 to 2020 for Manitoba crops grown on different stubbles. So we have here peas on wheat, 101%, peas on canola, 104%. If you're looking on planting peas on your canola, you can get away for, from some of those herbicide carryover issues. Um, we probably had with the RECAP program, I would say it was a pretty even split between wheat and canola fields. The canola looked great. There's no issues there from what we've saw, seen in the past couple of years. So it could be an option if you're looking at planting peas uh, and you were thinking wheat, but now maybe you might want to think on your canola stubble. So some more watch outs. 2021 was a fabulous year for kochia. 
And as we heard from Charles Geddes, there are some different options that you can do to kind of manage that kosha. I'm gonna unfortunately kind of burst your bubble here. Peas are terrible at competing with wheat. So if you are looking at planting peas in a field that had some kosher issues last year, you are gonna have to start thinking now and as you're going into the season of how you are gonna manage this weed. So from what we saw in 2021 and in previous years, herbicide layering is a really great option. So what I mean by herbicide layering is you are strategically layering those herbicides on that field to make sure that you have coverage and control of some of those germinating weeds at uh, pre-seed or post-seed pre-emerge. And then you are following up with an in-crop to get whatever weeds have emerged. Hopefully they're small and easy to control. And you're trying to keep that field as clean as possible up into flowering. So great options out there. Um, you can look in your guide to crop protection. Some ones that I'm just gonna throw out. Um, fierce authority products, heat products, all really good ones. Talk to your agronomists or agronomists, talk to your growers about these. They had great success, especially with kosha. Um, as well, in some areas, we did see some of that edge was applied, fall incorporated. It did a great job. Uh, spring of 2021 was extremely dry. So we were encouraging folks maybe not to go with the edge. We didn't want them to dry out their soil anymore. So some of those post-seed uh, pre-emerge options was really what we were looking for. And these are just a few little examples of what we saw up at the end of April. And unfortunately, some peas in July with some major coach issues. Another watch out for 2022, John Goblowski brought this up. Pea weevils are here. Um, I've heard about them lots of years in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Thought, you know what, this magic border, apparently we're keeping them out. Nope, not really. So in spring 2021, they were seen around the Reston area. We've been seeing them for a few, few years around in Swan River. In fall 2021, uh, they were seen as far west as Holland. This was on one of the McVet sites and the pea field that was surrounding it had volunteer peas. And it was Laura Schmidt from Manitoba Pulse Growers that found this one, not me, even though I live in Holland. But here you can see for I have a map here, we have a lot of different areas where they were noticed. Um, Laura also mentioned that high fall populations were seen around the Oak Burn area. So something else to be looking for. So here's a great picture that Laura has of just some of the damage that was seen. So along the leaf margins here, instead of a nice smooth leaf margin, we see a bit of almost a ruffled look where the bites have been taken out by the pea weevil. So what it reminded me of when I saw it was my grandma's doilies that she used to keep on her tables. Um, it just kind of looked like that really nice, beautiful ruffled edge of a doily. So something to watch out for. If you're walking into a pea field, um, these ones here were probably about four leaf stage, three leaf stage. Um, just take a look. If you do see that interesting um, leaf margin, as well as you probably will find the weevil close by, uh, pick it up, send it off to jo John Hurt or John Goplowski, and he will identify it for you. Another watch out for 2022. So back into disease, something we really haven't had to worry about in the past couple of years. Um, one that we are quite concerned about as our acres increase and potentially the frequency of peas within rotations for farmers is a phantomyces. So it has been found in more places. Typically, we were seeing it in the Southwest. In 2021, it was confirmed in a field near Swan River and another one near Arburg. And that was through our Manitoba Crop Diagnostic Lab, as well as the Plant, Surveil Plant Surveillance Initiative Lab. So the prevalence of this disease is going to increase as we grow more peas and in short rotations. Right now, our pea rotation you know, one in four years, one in five years for peas is good. Uh, you make sure you're putting it in with your other crops. Don't grow it back to back. But once you start getting some of these root rot issues, especially with phanomyces, you are going to need to extend that rotation even longer. So unfortunately, a is kind of like our club root and canola, um, but we don't have resistance at this time. There are some seed treatments that are registered for use, but it is one where if you do start seeing root rots in the field, you really need to go and get them identified accurately. Um, and then you need to start making some of your plans to deal with whatever that you have, whether it's Fusarium, uh, Pythium, or Aphanomyces. Another thing to watch for next year, I really hope, 
we have to watch for this, that we have beautiful lush canopies, we have adequate rainfall. Thick is our disease checklist. Uh, it does not pay to spray when your crop canopy is thin, your canopy is dry, your weather is dry and there's zero symptoms. It does pay to spray if you have a thick canopy, your canopy is wet when you go walking at about 10 o'clock in the morning, you have rain in the forecast and you have symptoms already starting on the bottom. So just keep those in mind um, and talk to growers about that as well. Harvest management. Um, we did see a lot of variability in immaturity this year, especially in later fields where we did all of a sudden get some rainfall and then things started to green up. Maturity variability is normal in peas. You do need patience. There are desiccant products that really do help reglone heat. Um, they are very good products, but patience is also needed with timing for that because your pea field is going to ripen at different stages. If you have a low spot, it's going to stay green longer. If you have knolls, chances are it's been ripened off for weeks. Um, a lot of questions that we did get this year is kind of like the sample picture that I was sent by a, a farmer is there can be the odd pea green, pea, green pea seed in your sample. Not really too much of a concern. Um, peas, if they have started to turn, they will continue to turn in the bin, even if they are not absolutely perfectly yellow and there's a bit of a green tinge to it, they are going to be graded as a yellow pea. They have to look pretty darn green for them to be graded as a green pea. Like think of, you know, John Deere green paint. That kind of green pea will be considered as a green pea. Also, some issues that we had this year and we have had in some past years is with the really dry weather at harvest, two dry peas started to crack and split. And farmers really needed to watch their cylinder speed and their concaves. Really threshing those peas out aggressively just increased the, the cracks and split. So if you know, cylinder speeds can be slowed down, concaves can be opened up, you go a bit slower, you are gonna have a much better quality pea coming out of your combine and then going to your buyer. One last thing to note, and this goes into agronomy does not stop when it comes out of the field, is storage. Your peas, like some of your other crops, will sweat for about six weeks after they are combined. Drying them down and cooling them down at harvest, fantastic idea but you do need to go back and check them. We have had, unfortunately, cases where peas have heated, they've had mold issues, um, just because a producer had, you know, dried them down adequately, left them, and then when he went to go ship them in March, came up with a few surprises. So going and checking those peas, maybe you haven't looked at your bins for a while, go and check them again, check the moisture, uh, check the temperature, see if there's any snow that's melting off the roof when they're not melting off of everybody else's. Um, and just make sure that everything just is maintained very well for that also high price commodity that's sitting in your bin. So just tips, follow up and uh, summary for 2022. Focusing on live plant counts, great place to start, six to eight live plants per square foot. Asking for a thousand kernel weight and germination is going to get you off on the right foot. Checking your seeding depth and adjusting as needed will help make sure that the most amount of plants are coming out of the soil successfully and at the same time as the other plants that hopefully will all contribute to yield. You want to reduce your stress in your crop. You need to choose a field to plant peas on that has no known herbicide carryover issues that I discussed. Use an inoculant appropriate for the conditions, uh, whether you're a first time pea grower, you know, um, seasoned pea grower, dry conditions, wet conditions. Plant a herbicide for weeds known on the field, use layering. So understanding that weed pressure that you have there, choosing products that's adequately gonna control them is going to really help you out. Watch out for those pea weevils. There are some foliar products that can be used as well. So things to consider if you are starting to see them and some thresholds, talk to John Gowlowski. Scout for root rots. If you're not quite sure what you're seeing, submit those samples for confirmation. Something I forgot to mention on a fan of my seeds, um, versus being just kind of a black root, your phanomyces is actually going to be a caramel color. So it's a little bit different than some of your other root rots, but something to note there. Using your pea fungicide checklist um, to when you are in crop and at flowering, looking for those foliar fungicides, and then focusing on your harvest management for quality. Patience when combining, patience when desiccating, uh, patience and adjustments as needed when threshing out your pea grain. And then a last one, watching that crop in the bin and making sure that the fantastic quality that you put in the bin is the fantastic quality you're getting out of the bin and going to your buyer.
if you are looking for more information, um, my information's there. We also have a couple of other agronomists on staff in Raquette, Bruce Frawley, which you may know from his previous days at Manitoba Agriculture as well. Uh, Jennifer McComb Tru, she is our organic pea specialist. So if you have questions on organics, she is your person. Also, Dennis Lang and the pulse specialist with Manitoba Pulse Growers. The pea industry is quite small. Uh, we try to keep in communication with each other and support each other. So really anybody on this list would be fantastic to talk to if you have additional questions. And with that, I am open for questions right now. Dennis? Uh, perfect. No, that's, that's excellent. Um, we do have a few questions here. And um, I'm just going to start off here. There was a, a note here from FMC. Um, just a clarification on Command 360. Uh, they say for to peas, it's 12 months, not two years. That was just a clarification from, from, from uh, um, that I had in the note section here. Um, but going to the actual questions, um, the first one is, how do you recommend handling seed lots with low germ? Um, so I would really, so first of all, if you're buying it from a seed grower, uh, certified number one is 85%. Uh, talking to them to on what that other 15% is made up of deads or abnormals um, can help you figure out some of those abnormals are going to grow some of them are going to produce plants, but adjusting your seeding rate to compensate for some of that germination, it would be worth your while. I know there are some seed lots out there that um, coming off the combine they had, you know, high 90s now their germination is lower they're probably looking at a certified number two. Uh, those ones, I know a lot of the seed growers are kind of looking into that to figure out what is going on. Um, under 85%, you are going to have to use some caution and probably increase your um, seeding rate and just to compensate for that. Great. Thank you. Um, another question that we have here is uh, peas on canola stubble. Any comment on mycorrhiza? And do you recommend using an inoculant? I would still definitely recommend using an inoculant for your nitrogen fixation. I'm not going to say that you need to use an inoculant for your mycorrhiza. Um, we did not see any difference in nodulation, growth, root development, yield, whether it was on pea stubble or wheat stubble. So for that um, combination for crop rotation, I, I'm sure there is a mycorrhizal thing going on in the soil, but I don't think it's as obvious as looking at corn on canola or flax on canola? Okay. Um, one of my favorite questions, um, with the high price of phosphate, what are your thoughts on using tag team inoculant product to replace some phosphate? I can see you smiling, Dennis. Maybe you want to answer this one. No. Go for it. Um, I'm sorry. I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I like 1152. Uh, some of those tag team products are great. But uh, you're, you're right, the price of phosphate is high. I would use products, probably each farm is different. If you've had great success with tag team, go with that. If you're not quite sure, 1152 um, has been proven to be a great product, very consistent. It's going to provide for your needs. So it's going to be based on the system that you're already working with, your experience with the product. But just moving into a new product just because it's cheaper, I would, I would really caution everybody to investigate that. Um, another question here, are the fusarium species the same for peas and soybeans? And have you seen fusarium in soybean and peas in our area? It says lab confirmed, or have seen fusarium in soybean and peas in our area from the person that wrote it. So, so, they're, so I'm not asking, they're just asking, are the same, are the species the same for peas and soybean for, for fusarium? Um, I'm not a pathologist, so I can't necessarily answer that. Um, I could would love some assistance from a pathologist if they they could answer that, um, but I'm I'm just going from by the testing that we were doing this year, bringing it into the crop diagnostic lab, and then them coming back with fusarium on peas. Uh, we were not looking at soybeans, just peas only. Okay. Um, another question here we have in small pockets. We got slightly more rain than the rest of the province. How concerned should we be with infinity carryover around the brand and then a dose area? Is pH and organic matter still a limiting factor? So with that, I'm really going to caution folks, talk to your um, rep from those different companies. 
um, gather the information that you do have for rainfall, uh, your individual fields, looking at the organic matter and pH, and probably the variation in that field before um, you're making any broad decisions on a field by field basis. I know the reps for all those companies are very aware of some of the issues that we had this year, um, but having that information for yourself with the amount of rainfall you actually did receive. And with rainfall, they're talking about rainfall kind of from that June 1 to September 1 timeframe. It's not from April 1 to, you know, November 1. So if you can grab that from the Manitoba Ag Weather Sites, knowing that, knowing within your field, do you have eroded knolls? Do you have sandy patches where your pH could be going up and your organic matter could be going down? You know, have those discussions with your agronomist or have those discussions with your clients, as well as those marketing reps for those companies that have those products. Okay, and we'll do one last question here. Um, this one may be a bit loaded, uh, a bit loaded question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Uh, how long is granular inoculum viable in the soil, or viable to survive in the soil? Best guess. That is a pretty loaded question. Um, I know there is some research out there looking at um, the amount of nodulation uh, in the crop and how long it lasts. I don't have that at my fingertips though, but if that person wants to send me an email, I can share that article with them and uh, we can discuss it later when we have more time. Yep, sounds good. So uh, with that, I think I'll wrap it up uh, for your presentation, but thank you very much. And I'll take note from Tammy, you know, a round of applause for, for you doing a great presentation here. So 